before we get into talking about uh, your uh, the Polar Palooza and some of the things that you're doing here at the conference, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, well, I was kind of wondering, what does the e-resources and serials librarian at Rollins College do? What's, what's your job responsibilities? The main responsibility would be managing the life cycle of our electronic resources mm -hmm. and serials, which are electronic and print. And that's from the trial stage at which we're just considering a product mm -hmm. all the way through to assessing and evaluating that product mm -hmm. and everything in between. So it's a lot of license negotiation, it's a lot of managing access access issues and doing a lot more troubleshooting than I ever thought I would be doing. Uh, yeah. But I'm also really lucky at Rollins because our technical services group or collections and systems, which is what our department is called, we also get the chance to do a lot of public services work. Mm -hmm. So I liaise with the English department. So I teach a lot of classes and do reference and research mm -hmm. consultations and you know it's a chance to kind of get out from downstairs. Okay, so you're doing both the technical and the public service. Yes, end. yes. But I also understand that one of your research interests is use-driven acquisitions and library vendor relations. Uh, what do you think are the most significant recent developments in these two areas? You know, I just finished co-authoring a book on use-driven acquisition, so this is really fresh in my mind. And I've been thinking about it a lot as almost an epic journey at this point. And when I got into uh, out of grad school and into the profession in 2010, what I was doing a lot of working for a vendor was setting up these use-driven acquisition plans. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, the hottest kid on the block at that point. And everywhere from the smallest libraries to the largest research one universities were setting up use-driven acquisition in some format or another. And so it caught on, libraries really took to it, and then inevitably what seemed to happen is that publishers started to push back. Mm -hmm. They don't have the guaranteed predictable revenue anymore. They don't know how much money they're going to be making from year to year from libraries. So there was this sort of pushback and we saw the explosion of the short-term loan, mm -hmm. price hikes, mm -hmm. and then yeah. we saw the pushback on that. And you know this sort of climax of contention happened I'd say maybe a couple years ago at which point the dust settled and what we're seeing now is new models and methods for use-driven acquisition that try to strike a balance between being feasible and sustainable for libraries but also being feasible and sustainable for content providers. Right. And that's things like reaching trigger levels at which point a purchase happens it may be a more reasonable way or new models like evidence-based acquisition that mm -hmm. do allow for a guaranteed amount of spend in a certain amount of time for publishers but also give some control to libraries. So I think what we're seeing now is uh, these new models emerging in the dust of some of the debacles we saw in the past and and the, and also more you know increasing communication I think between libraries and content providers over what really is going to work for both of us mm -hmm. and then so that takes me to you know the communication library sure. vendor communication which I think one of the biggest issues right now is all these mergers mm -hmm. we're seeing mm -hmm. yeah. you know yeah, somebody buys somebody and then it's almost like tit for tat then somebody buys mm -hmm. somebody else and so then they gobble up someone else and so now we're working with these right. sort of monopolies and it creates this mini panic in the library every time yeah. what does this mean for our workflow what does this mean for invoicing and pricing and licensing and uh, underneath all of that is communication yes. I always come back to that that's the pillar that that holds all these other things up and also that creates these long-lasting and, and sustainable relationships between vendors and libraries so that when something like this happens, when a merger or an acquisition happens, it's not cause for panic because maybe we've been part of the conversation right. as opposed to being swept along mm -hmm. in it. So I think that there's the, there's some promise of some better communication and relationships moving forward um, as the outcome of some of these mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you kind of edit our Hot Topics yes. uh, column for uh, the ATG News Channel, which right. is our website. And I was wondering, from that perspective, what do you think are the truly hot topics in the field right now? I love writing this column first, <laughs> and, and I was so nervous about it when I first started doing it. I kept this little notepad by my computer monitor, you know, what are hot topics? And I was always going out and looking for them. Now I don't even have to look because it seems like it's just, you know, constantly coming my way uh, some of the hottest topics definitely revolve around 
our place in the world. And mm-hmm. that's, I think that's never going to go away. Who are we? You know, who are libraries? Who are librarians? What is our place? And, and where do we fit in this rapidly changing landscape of, of technology? And what is going to be our identity in the digital age? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the hot topics kind of come from that overarching question a lot of times and and one of the biggest topics and and also the focus of a lot of sessions this year at Charleston is open access Mm -hmm. and that's something that at Rollins we're really delving into and figuring out how can we support our faculty and also encourage them toward decent models of open access while educating them on potentially predatory models or predatory Mm -hmm. publishers. Um, So that seems to be a pretty hot, buzzy topic at the moment. Um, I'd also say a lot of these mergers and acquisitions are are on everyone's minds. Let me follow up on the open access. What's been the reaction of your faculty? Because in some cases, faculty just aren't aware of it. They don't, it's not uh, a cause the way it may be for some librarians. What has what has been the reaction of your faculty? That's pretty much what we're experiencing, and, and it is discipline specific. So I work with the English department. That's my liaison department, and it's a bit of a different animal in the humanities than in the sciences, for example. I, I have a feeling that our science faculty are more aware of it because there are a lot of open access journals out there that, that um, have been around for a while and have a reputable name in the business, whereas in the humanities I think it's still some murky territory. But I do get the sense that our faculty are, they might be aware of open access as a a thing, but I think they're hesitant to publish in open access journals because they still have a bit of a reputation as being the underdogs Mm -hmm. or maybe not having so much clout toward promotion and tenure. And we have a really competitive promotion and tenure system at Rollins. And uh, I think there's some fear sometimes that, you know, if I'm not publishing in this exact journal Mm -hmm. that has the highest impact or the, or, you know, the most reputable name, then, you know, why why would I pick open access if that's not going to put me on the ladder toward promotion and tenure? as much as this other journal would. So what we're trying to do is enact more of a, like a cultural change at Rollins or a behavioral change and that gets them thinking about the moral imperative behind publishing in open access um, and and not so much always thinking about the bottom line of what's the the best journal I can publish in. You find that once uh, faculty have tenure that they are more open to I mean, I'm just thinking, if you had tenure, we'd be more open to open access than if you were still struggling along that tenure track, which we've all struggled upon. I think so. I think that once our faculty get tenure, there's a lot of open doors. You know, you, maybe you get to publish slightly outside of your mm-hmm. area. You know. Um, I work with a librarian who's really, really interested in comic book history, and so that's what he does a lot of publishing in. And even though we're not told hard line, oh, you have to be publishing in your exact niche of librarianship, it's highly encouraged. So I think once you get tenure, there's a bit more freedom to step outside the box, and part of that would be publishing in in open access journals. I know that last year, um, you and a colleague hosted the first end of conference Polapalooza. Can you kind of tell us what that was all about and and, and what did you learn from it? Well, I always like to say Palooza means fun, and I don't know if that's true or not, but I feel like if you add Palooza to the end of something, it's just going to you know get people excited. And at the end of a conference, it doesn't matter what conference it is, people are burned out. And it, it, even the best session in Charleston definitely has some of the best sessions of any conference. Even the best session involves a lot of you sitting in the audience being talked at and then maybe there's some time for Q&A at the end. So it's so great to have this kind of low stress, fun, collaborative uh, opportunity at the end of a conference where you're not just being talked at but you're also part of the conversation the entire time. You're part of steering the conversation the entire time and you're creating the content and you see it coming up live on the screen in front of you you know you see your answers and and the rest of the audience's answers and opinions and and it really lends to a very lively mm-hmm. and sometimes uh, you know, positively contentious debate <laughs> comes out of that. I, it really is fun. And also the anonymity aspect of it helps because I know that there are people in sessions because I've been one of them who is hesitant to ask a question or to speak up and give an opinion because 
you know you're in a room of people you don't know yeah. so if you're able to do that anonymously through the polling software that's that's a lot more fun and I think you get a lot more honesty and candid conversation out of it one thing I did learn though is that it's hard to get a big audience at the end of the conference mm -hmm. you know I think a lot of people leave sure. or like I said they're kind of burnt out so we're hoping for a bigger mm -hmm. crowd this year yeah because you are doing it again this year yes right? yes so what significant issues are you going to be polling folks about have you decided I like to do a real grab bag and some of them come out of the hot topics mm -hmm. columns you know what's been hot over the last year and as I was saying I think open access is going to be a big one I really want to know what people are doing uh, for open access initiatives at on their campuses or in their organizations and also how are they educating people about it and so that's going to be a big one but then I like to also take common themes that arise from the conference itself so that's what's great about doing this at the end of the conference and the the polling software I use is so easy to you know I could just add a question quickly so for example I sat in on a, a session this morning about predatory open access publishing and it got me thinking about okay that's that might be something I want to ask about are, are people conscious of this but then I also like to make it fun so Charleston is is a unique conference because it doesn't move around every year so it, you're not just coming back to a conference you're coming back to a place and it's like a treasured friend mm -hmm. that you get to yeah. to meet every year and so I'm going to ask questions about the Charleston experience, you know, restaurants that you enjoy or, uh, you know, some of these, um, like the ghost tours and things that, that are offered and, you know, what are your favorite things about the city and, oh, what's really fun, last year I asked uh, suggestions for next year's theme and we got some really <laughs> funny <laughs> answers, so I think I might reprise that one again. Mm.